sorry? I was put on a pedestal growing up. You were? I mean, even I was a ward of the state, but because of my, um, my intelligence and um, my skills and my talents and stuff like that, um, I was given a lot of recognition from like, you know, judges and the people in the courts and stuff like that, because most of my time was spent between there and college. You got special treatment, you think? I know I did. I know I did. It made it kind of hard at some of them homes because, you know, you got to go back to, you know, the unit with those people and live with them. And I like to think that I never took the, um, the gifts given me and uh, made anybody feel less than. I would always make a point to, you know, point out my other, you know, like school friends for answers and stuff. Don't just pick out me, you know. I was probably supposed to be like the most successful person in the world based on everything that was given to me. Um, Can I get you to pull your hair off your face? Yeah. That really happened. Um, we were getting, we were being mistreated at home really, really, really badly. Me and my uh, two other siblings. I was a middle child. Um, by the age of five, my mother was uh, selling us in order to do drugs herself. And um, so your original, your biological parents. My biological mother, we were taken away from when we were barely even two. And my other sister would have been five, six at the time. What happened there? Because she was neglecting us, which is, uh, which is why I was deaf at the time as well. It was medical neglect. So I went through this foster home with these people who adopted me for about three, four years before anybody figured out that I was actually deaf and not stupid. <laughs> it's... Um, it was kind of cool. Um, I still know sign language, though. So. Your hearing came back? I, w I had to have tubes put in my ears twice, surgery and everything. Oh, really? Yeah, because well, I wasn't born that way. You know what I'm saying? I was sick and just nobody had known it. So that was kind of different. So back to your second adopted family. Um, so that adopted family, they were right, she was rotten after she, had, um, after she had divorced their adopted father. I mean, she was just a whole different person. And uh, we were made to stay with her. And uh, my sister started running away and things were really bad. And uh, we couldn't do nothing about it, none of it. You know, I remember the police showing up at the house a couple of times telling, you know, because the neighbors had called because of screaming and stuff. And I remember being black and blue one time and the cop telling my parents just not to leave them a mark next time and walked out of the house. Um, my sister ran away two days before um, Easter, and uh, on Easter morning, the police came to tell us that the house burned down that morning, had uh, been due to um, her body being set on fire. Uh, one of the men that my mom was allowing to come into the house had taken her to an abandoned house and raped her, and uh, he used uh, a Spanish to kill her, and then he set her on fire. Um, that was life-changing for me. I went from being the... How old was she? She was 12. Unfortunately, she was every pedophile's dream come true because she was Native American and white. So by the time that she was 12, she was carrying around double Ds. The first newspaper clipping said a body of a 20 to 30 year old woman had been found. No. Um, I went from being that quiet kid that caused no problems because, you know, the hearing made me a mark in the house with everybody. I was easy pickings to somebody totally different after that. And I got put in the system. I, my mother came to a school one day and told us that she was pregnant with her own kids. And uh, my idea was that you're gonna replace my sister and you're gonna hurt these kids too. And uh, I snapped. I took a metal baseball bat. So th this is your third set of parents. This, she says, this, "This is the this is the adopted parents. They never, they uh, they never changed. She never, she was never removed from us." You, you told me they were selling you. Um, she did. Yeah, she was like, for her drug habit, she was allowing men to come in and do things to us. I remember the first time. She's never, she was never charged. I didn't tell anybody until I was sixteen. You know, I didn't know what to say, but um, by the time everything had exploded at the house with her news of having a babies, 
I was being carted off to um, a volleyball camp at the University of Illinois in Champaign, Illinois. I'd been one of 10 girls that had been um, picked to go to summer camp there with all the players. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't last. I got into a fight with a girl over um, a checkbook that somebody had given me and wasn't theirs to give it to me. The girl made a comment about my sister being killed and uh, pushed her out the window. And so my mother came to get me, the adopted mother. She came to come get me that night, and instead of taking me home, she took me to the hospital, and uh, I never went back to her house ever again in my life. So you, you grew up in what, what city? DCFS from 9 to 18 in the state of Illinois. No, but you grew up in Tennessee? Tennessee is home for us. Um, when we got to have the in-between breaks with Dad and her, we go back to Tennessee, but she's the one that moved us to uh, Illinois. Oh, I see. So I went, I went back home a year later. To Southern Illinois? I'm back home to Tennessee. No, but Southern Illinois? Oh, uh, with her? Yeah, it's like Central. It's like Central Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, well, anyway, I, I ended up in the system after that part where... Um, Mark, I was in 136 homes in a year, in one year's time period. It was like the system was moving me to keep me from somebody or something. I don't understand. I was always praised for being very intelligent. I was always, you know, put up on, you know, the exam board because of all my abilities, you know, how articulate I am and just it, all of that. I always kind of felt like um, unrealistic. Like these people didn't really see me, you know, because of all of that. I was a, uh, I was attending the U of I at the age of 14, because I won a essay contest with a school science project that I didn't know was being submitted. So I didn't even get to have the real college experience. DCFS came to my classes with me, you know, and stuff like that. And I still went back to the children's home at night, you know, but. Um, most of my life, I lived out of a bag. I didn't really talk to people because I was moved around so much. And because I got to the point where telling my story and what was happening to us was just, it didn't affect me in the least anymore. You know, I could turn things off and uh, I was dealing with so much in all these homes. I've been locked in cages. I've been starved. We, um, I've fought. I mean, literally had to go into the basement and fight other student, other, you know, other foster kids, you know. Um, I remember being locked under the stairs for a period of time. I, was, uh, I remember at 13, the doctor saying I was the makings of a mass murderer because of everything that was going on and because of how quiet I was, but how intelligent I was. And as a kid, you, you, you revel in that, the anger because everybody left me. You know, I have my biological family and I have an adopted family. And no matter what, none of them ever came to find me in the system. They just left me be. And all this other stuff was happening and nobody gave a shit. So, you know, I was pretty pissed off. Pretty hateful myself. You know, God couldn't love me and nobody else dared. Um, everything kept happening at all these homes. You know, something good would come and then like bad things would just knock it all away. You know, I'll, um, I got close to a lot of girls that would, you know, confide in me. And then like, all of a sudden, Jean's running away, and we find out after a month that she's been raped inside and out with a knife and lives the month to tell who her killer is and leaves me a note. I'm 12 years old at the time. This stuff was unreal. And I still only did weed, because when I would run away from the children's home, I would always end up like finding the people in the hood and stuff like that. And I'm the white girl. I had braces and everything back then, glasses and stuff. So, you know, people were always checking my hair and wondering, you know, whether or not it was real. And, um, I wonder sometimes myself. 
because I put myself in a lot of bad positions just to try and get hurt so I wouldn't be here no more. And uh, I can tell you all the things that happened in all those times. I remember an encounter with a staff member, a head staff member of a children's home. I was having a sexual relationship with him for a period of time. Very interesting. I grew up really fast and um, very kind of mean after a while, you know. I got into martial arts. I was very athletic. Um, I, anything that was a challenge, I was in it. You know, not just, you know, intellectually, but physically. And uh, started fighting and getting myself in trouble that way, right? How old are you now? I'm 39. You're 39? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. I'm not the same woman today as I was back then, by any means. I struggle. Where have you spent your 20s and 30s? Um, my, so I have traveled to more than 38 states. I would consider myself free-spirited and a wanderer. All those that wander are not lost, though. Okay. I don't. I'm not comfortable sitting still. All those years with my husband, I did. We had a home out there in uh, southern Illinois, and then when he got sick, we moved up to Chicago. That was an experience. I didn't really get into drugs or nothing, though, you know? I think, like, my way of outing, I was a cutter. I was a self-harmer. I didn't, um, I got to a point in my life by that, you know, period of time where I wanted to spread the goodness. I seen how bad the world was and I was kind of naive to shit. Very naive to everything. Cause you know, I used to think that the real world was out here in consideration, you know, how I was growing up, but I never really had the, the full depth of just how, how different because I didn't have that communication with people. I didn't have a bond with people. I don't understand how society worked. I don't have the politics of everything. I was just kind of a, a mute, per se. But, when, um, when did your hearing come? Um, the surgery happened by the age of, by the time I was about four or five, we got the surgeries completed to where I could hear again. It took two of them. You know, so I went, I went for about that many years in life without, which was, just, it was neat because I know sign language from it, you know? But, um, 20s and 30s, I was really, I was not doing good. You know, I, when I got emancipated from the system before I met my husband, I was in just, I didn't know how to survive out here. I didn't know how to be around people. I didn't know how to, you know, form relationships with people. And I was still very hurt and upset by my family who was in the same town that I was in, but had no communication with me at all. Like I didn't exist. I always wonder what I'd done to deserve that, because uh, I didn't. Um, my sister and I, I have a little sister that they raised, you know, that was my biological. She and I don't get along at all because of everything that, and, you know, I endured through those years. And um, I tried so hard in my early 20s, I tried so hard to build a relationship with her, which was why some of the traveling was happening, you know, that way we could experience things together and she could see that life wasn't just like one horse town. You know, like they grew up in, you know, a couple of little towns and that was the most they'd ever moved in their life. Hell, I couldn't unpack my house after I got married for a year and a half because I wasn't sure if I was going to be there tomorrow. You know, based on how I grew up. And so that was really odd, um, an odd relationship for me to try and fix, I guess you could say. The judge was my father. The judge was my father and his little stenographer lady. She was like my big sister. And the mentor I had was a previous therapist that um, very well known, um, she was a beautiful woman that was more of a mother to me than anybody in my life. I had some really good influences, thank the Lord, because after um, those first years, you know, traveling around and stuff in my 20s, 
I had a couple of bumps and I really needed some kind of guidance and um, it wasn't all that great. I got put in prison. I got put in prison for defending myself. The judge told me I used excessive force. I took a baseball bat to a guy's elbows and knees, his knees. He'd been molesting his sons for years. Turned him out. So, after everything that he'd been doing and all the things he'd been saying to me for all that time, I kind of felt like, you know, when the day came that he actually tried to force himself on me, I was prepared. After that, I got the smarts because, you know, you get into prison and you meet all these people that, you know, are very intelligent and very talented. And you start figuring out other stupid things to do. And I didn't feel like I ever had anybody that I had to answer to. Nobody gave a shit about me. And so disappointments and stuff like that didn't mean nothing. That didn't register with me. So I hurt people a lot. To my husband. To my husband. But. James and I met when I was on a, I was supposed to go to a party for the weekend with some friends and instead it ended up being somebody's family reunion. They totally blew me. So after I, you know, played my role, I was polite to his whole entire family because I was so far from home. I told him to leave me alone. I ended up talking to the guy at the bar. I married that man three weeks later. He was 20 years older than me. I was 19, he was a bachelor at 39. Eight and a half years together until uh, cirrhosis of the, the liver took him. How many kids do you have? I've had seven. I have five now. I've lost two. That's why I'm out here. That's how I ended up in California. I, um, I got to finally, um, have a relationship with um, two of my sons that had been adopted years after I got out of um, DCFS. I've never been able to keep my kids. They've always taken them from me. Because of drugs? No, because of my own history with them. You know, I'd have the jobs, I'd have everything in a row. I was just never good enough. How did you lose two of your kids? Um, well, one of them would have killed me if I would have taken all away. And so they took him out. Yeah, eight I'm months. sorry, what happened? Baby, was, I was going to bleed out with the baby. So they took about eight months inside me. Oh, that was crazy. I'm on, my son, my 16-year-old son, um, he just killed himself. Um, I've been a year now. Don't feel like no year. He was autistic. I remember the day that my sister showed up. I knew something was wrong because I don't talk to her at all. I don't, I don't even know that sister. I'll tell you the day that they, she told me it was him that was gone. I lost my mind. I didn't think, you know, autistic kids, they don't really do stuff like that. I didn't know that, you know? And in the back of my head, I had a fight with, you know, wondering if it was true or, or if they'd done, if they'd done it to him. His adopted parents, who were my, my adopted father's sister and husband. Um, let's see, my drug use was limited to marijuana growing up for the most part because I used to transport. I used to cook dope, make it, sell it and everything else. But me and my girlfriend, we used to transport between Illinois and Tennessee, crack and weed and stuff. So I knew the dangers of all that stuff. I was kind of, you know, uppity about it. Never was into pills because I'm more of a spiritual, medicinal, herbal stone. But because of all the issues I'd had growing up and all the abuse, I made a 
crazy decision to try a sex site online and meet up with a guy for some light BDSM only to find out a month after we started meeting up with each other that he was in fact banging me in the neck with meth when he was choking me out. So the reason I wouldn't work on my girlfriend when I got home was because I didn't have the right stuff. And from there I did research to shoot myself and continued a pretty crazy drug habit. Especially the method of, you know. Um, Is that what you're using now? Actually, I'm clean for a week. I shot myself in the foot because I ain't got nowhere else to shoot. The doctors did all that, believe it or not. But I myself didn't have nowhere else to shoot and tried to shoot myself in the foot and I got cellulitis. Cellulitis and ended up in the hospital. How you like that? Crazy. So they clay for a week. I'm not gonna use a needle ever again. That's enough to wake me up. I like, mm. I like the effects of the drug because it allows me to be uninhibited and deal with the things. But I've kind of found out here recently that Sherm is awesome. And I look at myself and I'm like, how the hell did I get to where I am today? How did I go from all that with all those good people in my life to this? What is going on? You come out here, you get your shit stolen. You don't have it once or twice because no, you're just stupid and you, people aren't like that back home. So then you gotta wait and do everything from a far distance and you're struck because you can't do shit. Because you're sitting around waiting on documents, right? Somehow or another that led me to a bottle of Sherm. But I don't know about the the natural effect of it, because obviously it's like, like embalming fluid, isn't it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know this much. It has helped a lot with the healing of my son. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? And the four times that I've done it. I've, um, the experiences that I got to have with people and the conversations really kind of brought to light some of my stuff in life. And, uh, Wake me up a little bit. I know it's time to go back home. I got other kids waiting on me to get you know myself back together. Where are you staying now? <sighs> I jump around a little bit. I don't too well get along with people out here because uh, I'm not selling my body. I always have what I need. If I don't, I'll go without. And then whatever else people use me to fucking few their goals or whatever else. I could toss it the best so much in my life, I don't care. Like, you can't do any harm to me. I really literally learned young that y'all don't matter. It's me against the world, you know? I think the only thing that's thrown me off Mark being out this way besides the fact that people are hateful and judgmental and so rude have been the stalkers. Stalkers are the crazy ones. That makes you know, my anxiety so bad, I can't get stuff done sometimes. You don't know if somebody's gonna come snatch you up or if, you know, why the hell are y'all watching me? And my life is crazy, so if you're just following me around doing me all the time, you are just as crazy as me. <laughs> so serious. What's your biggest fear now? I'm not gonna make it out of here, alive. I've, um, I've had death threats and stuff happen out here just because, um, I don't know. I don't know, like I said, I don't know the politics of the cities and the streets and stuff like that. I barely know it and you know, just to get by in my life. But um, out here, I'm a real no-no. I don't understand why people feel the need to wake up every day and go, hey, I gotta make money. Let's go chase a dollar. 
well, if I were back home, I'd be on the farm. And I would, I mean, between the animals and what they provide and all the, you know, the gardens and stuff. That's work. And you get paid and you get to sit around and you get to enjoy it. So it's fast paced living ain't really all, all it's cut out to be for me. <laughs> I have a weird habit too. I'm a, I like the night times because it's peaceful. And I ain't got no fear. There's not a man out here that's gonna put fear in my heart because of everything that I went through as a kid growing up. I'm gonna walk the streets. I'm gonna ride my bike around. I don't give a fuck if you threaten to kill me because uh, you can get it back. I promise you that. You know, after a while you respond to these people, but I, I'm not gonna stop. <laughs> I walk around and wander because that's my, you know, I'm just getting shit on my brain and it's peaceful for me. And it's like, The danger? Hell, I'd be more scared of myself the day that I finally snapped, Mark. Cause I ain't done it since my son died. I haven't let it all out, not once. I'd hate to be the motherfucker that it, it does happen to finally though, I'm telling you that. I'm brutal when it comes to just, you know, a face-to-face -face confrontation because I'm truthful, you know? It's crazy. Christine, what would, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Mark, I teach my kids this every day too, that kindness is strength. And that's why I say this. When I left the Chisholm's homes and all those experiences, I had a chip on my shoulder and you couldn't look at me, you know, without me just being, mm. with the healing that I, I had with my husband's relationship and, you know, learning stuff as I went with him, I realized, you know, that I didn't ever want to make people feel the way that I was made to feel because that wasn't right. And that's my goal in life. I want to spread, you know, I'm a cheerleader. You know, I would rather pick you up and, you know, put you towards your goals and, you know, motivate you every day to do something like that than to see, you, you know, you down and feeling like crap and everybody just shitting on each other. And uh, um, I would definitely say that, you know, be mindful of the people, you know, be mindful of yourself and the people around you these days more so than anything. Just be safe. Be safe on a spiritual level. Because I think this experience opened my eyes to the reality of where we're at in today's world for real and just be kind to each other. Because we, we were meant to love each other. Everybody is like hating because you're different and it's like, you're supposed to embrace that. We were never intended to be like each other. You know, there's beauty in all that. And it's sad, people can't see it. All right, Christine. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. I wish you lots of luck out here.